Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. This is Muhammad Shafiq bin Burhanuddin. In this episode of Nazra, we will discuss on ideas of critical importance for the present-day Muslim world. With us is Datuk Dr. Syed Ali Taufik Alatas, who was the formerly the Director General of the Institute of Islamic Understanding Malaysia, IKIM, at the appointment of the former Prime Minister of Malaysia. Subsequently, he was the advisor at the Al Bukhari Foundation Malaysia. To begin with, uh, just a brief background about uh, our guest today. Datuk Syed Ali Taufik Alatas was previously the Director General of the Institute of Islamic Understanding uh, Malaysia, IKIM, at the appointment of the former Prime Minister of Malaysia between 2005 to 2009. And subsequently, he was appointed as the advisor at the Al Bukhari Foundation, Malaysia. That thought, to begin with, uh, we'd like to express our gratitude for not only agreeing to this interview, but for your contributions at this uh, institute during your leadership which I feel have given many youth and many Muslims such as myself the inspiration and hope that, that there are still personalities who will speak this religion uh, without compromising some of our fundamental beliefs. Um, Dato, in retrospect, uh, do, uh, since your leadership here, uh, many issues have begun to emerge in this, in, this, in this day of age. Of course, uh, many efforts and many resources, have many, uh, a lot of money have been put in to, uh, to, to try to revive, try to restore the, 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 the place of Islam in the public sphere. We know, for instance, that the, uh, there has been a, a project called Islamization uh, propagated by certain uh, groups in, uh, in many parts of the Muslim world. And a lot of money has been spent in the Islamic financial institutions as well. Not to mention in, in terms of education as well, in, in terms of our universities in the Muslim world. Uh, how do you feel with regards to how these resources uh, and these energies that has been spent over the years? Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Shafiq. Yes. Uh, and thank you also to Ikim for inviting me today. Yes. To answer your question, I think we should say that the problems that we were trying to overcome during my time yes. and the problems that exist today yes. are the same. They have not gotten better. Right. In fact, in many respects, they've gotten worse. Sure. And although we have tried uh, to address some of these concerns, yes. because the problem is quite large and it requires not just one individual, but many individuals to overcome this, yes. I think it's a, it's a big hurdle, especially when you have uh, a lot of elements that work against you. Okay. Chiefly amongst these elements is um, I think this corruption of knowledge, right. I mean, before we spoke about this, and I think if we were to try to explain what this means, yes. if uh, someone who is not, or some, yala, someone who is not uh, prepared yes. to clearly understand and elucidate a certain uh, element of knowledge mm. he is not qualified to and therefore whatever he tries to propagate mm. will not be what it actually is okay. in other words if someone gives you a piece of knowledge yes. and you claim to have understood it and mastered it okay. but then when you try to teach it it becomes different okay. different for the worst yes. this is the corruption of knowledge and this is actually what happens in the Muslim countries today. Right. We don't understand many things, and yet we claim to understand them. Yes. Now, earlier you just said just now about this project of Islamization. Yes. My father has spoken about this and written about this yes. in the early 70s. Okay. It, was his, uh, it was his platform. Sure. It was his idea. Right. But his idea, and then the subsequent idea of Islamization propagated by these groups that you mentioned yes. is completely different. Okay. On the one hand, my father was speaking of uh, the Islamization of knowledge in terms of 
what is this Islamization of knowledge? Sure. Chiefly, it was to Islamize what had not been Islamized, right. or rather what had become other than Islam. Okay. And the way to do this to begin with was through the language. Right. So Islamization begins with language. Sure. Now, his idea of Islamization was more of a substantial Islamization, whereas the one that you speak of, this Islamization, mm -hmm. is more formative. Right. They're more interested in the outward appearance yes. of the Muslims, yes. not of the knowledge itself. Yes. Whereas my father was speaking of knowledge, part of knowledge, Islamization through language. Yes. Once you, once you, uh, once you uh, play with the language yes. or change the language, yes. what happens is the understanding of that thing that is described by that language becomes altered yes. because mind and thought, I mean thought and uh, language mm -hmm. are reflexive. Sure. And if you start changing the language, then the thought also becomes different. Right. Similarly, if you have something in your mind and you don't know how to express it, yes. it might not be what you have in your mind mm. when you express it because you don't know how to express it properly. Sure. Now this is actually what Islamization was. Mm not the formative or the outward appearance that uh, these institutions that you mentioned yes. are doing, yes. where they are talking more about the Muslims, yes. their outward behavior, right. not their inner behavior and not their, not their knowledge faculties. Mm. And this is, in my opinion, this is a big corruption yes. because what you are doing is, you are, you are, it's like the, there's a saying, isn't it? Mm. The saddle is different, but the donkey is the same. Yes. This is what we are doing. We are changing the saddle. The donkey remains the same. Yes. This is the problem. Mm. Uh, like you said, I mean, this 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 course about uh, trying to uh, restore the, the Muslims' uh, situation, current state of affairs, has been done. I, mean, I think, like you, I mean, since the time of your father in the seventies, even at the level of the OIC. I mean, do you feel that perhaps the the mistake is pertaining to how they see what the problem is really? because they have not really understood that the problem is, is linked to something internal, something to uh, the Muslims' understanding, like you said, the problem of corruption. De definitely. Yes. Well, I mean, I think, I mean, I don't know why you bring up the OIC, because in reality, I mean, uh, I don't think the OIC also has contributed much to the Muslims. Okay. Now, I mean, you notice that I'm talking about Muslims. Yes. We are not talking about Islam here. Okay. I mean, because Islam doesn't need, mm. <laughs> it doesn't need defense. Okay. Islam is by itself already a perfect and clear and, uh, and uh, 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 what do you call it, merciful religion, actually. Yes. The damage that's being done in the name of Islam is being done by the Muslims. Yes. Of course, I mean, we can blame the West as well, but the West has always had this program. Mm. It's not something new. Mm. There is no such thing as Islamophobia. Mm. It's all a demonization program, right. demonization of Islam and the Muslims. Right. But it, be, it becomes easier today to demonize because of the Muslim behavior, because of the way the Muslims are behaving. Right. And therefore, we shouldn't be talking about uh, how to advance Islam. It's not Islam that needs advancing. I mean, it, it's as if we don't understand the Quran itself when it says we have perfected your religion for you this day. Yes. Yes. Isn't it? Yes. I mean, there's no more perfecting or advancing that we can do. Who are we? Yes, yes. The, the problem is the Muslims themselves. The Muslims have corrupted knowledge. Yes. And the Muslim leaders are the ones to blame. Mm. Mm. And the problem is now that this has become uh, uh, in the realm of politics. Right. Politics now has taken over. Okay. I mean, in, in reality, this reminds me of being in the 11th century Europe. Okay. I mean, you know, 11th century Europe was a very dark time. Okay. There was no uh, vibrant uh, seeking of knowledge at that time in Europe. Right. I mean, this only happened hundreds of years later. Okay. And even then, they called it a renaissance, mm. as if there was something there to rediscover to begin with. I mean, a renaissance means that, to rediscover. Yes. Yes. In other words, you are supposing that there is something that you have discovered beforehand, and only now you are rediscovering when that's not the case. Right. Isn't it? So you really can't call it a, a renaissance, but, but that's them. Mm. In our case, though, I mean, in the 11th century, we were, there was a very vibrant uh, uh, 
knowledgeable atmosphere. Yes. There were lots of uh, sciences being done. There were lots of discourse being done. There was lots of things going on. Yes. I mean, they were the leaders and the advanced people in terms of knowledge, in terms of law, in terms of politics, in terms of uh, commerce, in terms of anything, yes. in, in terms of the arts. Yes. They were very vibrant. And the, 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 the European learned from them. I mean, for instance, 11th century, we are talking about Andalusia now. Mm -hmm. Andalusia was a time, this is Ibn Rushd, the time sure. of Ibn Rushd. Sure. The time of uh, all these philosophers, these theologians, all their ideas were milling around at that time. Right. And I mean, European, the European uh, uh, countries, mm. they bordered Andalusia. Yes. And yet, how is it that they didn't really get to know much about what was happening in Andalusia? I mean, Peter Abelard was one person at that time who was, who was uh, benefiting yes. from the discourse in the Muslim Andalusia. Yes. Peter Abelard was the one who was saying that we should not simply take theological or theology. Yes. Uh, we should not simply understand it by its, uh, what do you call it, letter, mm. that they should use reason. He started saying we should use reason to understand theology. Oh, this was a great anathema to the, mm. to the church, right. a great affront to them. Right. They didn't want that. Mm. And therefore they asked, uh, what's his name? St. Bernard mm. of Assisi mm. to argue with uh, Peter Abelard. Mm. I mean, this is how the control of the church and the control of the politicians at that time, they were the lords of the feudal system. Yes. They worked hand in hand to control the population. The more ridiculously ignorant you were, the better for them. Right. They were the ones, the church would control what you think, how you think, mm. what books you could read, right. what books were allowed. In today's terminology, you would say, they were the ones who would determine what is haram, what is halal. And we have this problem today. Yes, yes, yes. We have this problem with these so-called leaders of the Muslims. Yes the so-called uh, knowledgeable ones, the ones who, be, who, who are heaped on uh, awards and all kind of recognition, for what? Yes, yes. They are the ones who are, who are saying what is haram, what is halal. Yes. As far as I know, as far as Islam says as well, what is haram and what is halal is already clear. Right. Allah has made that clear in the Quran. What is haram, what is halal, it's clear. Yes. The only, <coughs> the, the one who can say what is haram and what is halal is only Allah. It is His prerogative. Yes. So who are these people then, therefore, today to say this is haram, this is halal? I mean, yes. they are causing great ignorance, mm. and they don't see it because they are so arrogant. Mm. And this is the problem. When I was here at Ikim, I used to say this. Right. And yet, they are the ones who have done a campaign mm. of exclusion against us right. because of this. I see. I mean, this is true. This is a fact. Mm -hmm. The campaign of, of exclusion. Therefore, they think that we don't know anything, yes. that we should be ignored. We are the arrogant ones. Mm. Actually, it's not the case. Mm. But Nato, would, wouldn't you attribute this, this uh, situation, this, this situation of chaos or disorder, you know, this, this so-called crisis? In, part, in our particular region, there's this, this colonization factor. I mean, in terms of the education, when the, the colonizers brought in uh, foreign institutions like the, the University, uh, University of Malaya, for instance, the, the English schools they brought here. So that creates sort of, um, you know, a sort of confusion in, in terms who, in terms of who's who to refer to pertaining to religion, for instance. Uh, I mean, and even today we see that uh, many among the educated Muslims they cannot distinguish between the traditional scholars. I mean, the, uh, the, the, the authorities of the traditional scholars uh, and the academic scholars. So they, they make this dichotomy. I believe it's the fault of politics and politicians. Right. They are the ones who elevate these people to mm -hmm. positions, ridiculously extreme positions. Right. They are the ones who do that mm -hmm. because they have this mentality mm -hmm. that uh, they are the ones with this colonial mentality, actually. Right, right. The politicians right. and the ones in politics who interfere with religion. And they've done this all the time. Right. It's not something that is, that is just now. Mm. But now mm. the phenomenon is even bigger. I, see. I mean, look at the time of the former prime minister mm. when he started talking about Islam Hadari. Yes. I'm the one who said that this is not uh, a new religion. Okay. You cannot actually call it this. Mm. That what we should be calling it is to, to uh, 
to understand the problems of the Muslims today within the framework of Islam, if that's what you mean by Islam Habari. Right. Of course, that's not what they meant. Mm. It was a political platform. Right. And today we have another one. Yes. Today we have this wasatiya. Yes. Everything is moderation, qasad haran in Malay. Yes. Yes. But it's ridiculous, as if it comes from the Quran. Yes. And these are the people who are propagating, I mean, the ones from this, this, uh, this uh, so-called elevated scholars, mm. the ones who are elevated by the politicians. Mm. That's why I'm saying the politics and politicians have, have now manipulated religion right. for the masses. Right. They are the ones who determine who the ulama are. Mm. They are the ones who will raise these people up to, to these uh, positions of ridiculous honor. Mm. They are the ones who give them platforms. Mm. And therefore, these people speak with impunity. Right. Again, it's the, the fault of the ulul amr. Mm. I mean, look, if you start talking about wasatiyah now, yes. moderation, and then say, oh, as if it's from the tradition of, the, of Islam, it's as if it comes from the Quran, because they, they love to use this, uh, this verse, mm. ummatan wasatan, yes. isn't it? Yes. And then you say, see, there it is. Mm. They don't realize that that verse, the term wasat there, if you go and look at uh, Tabari or Tirmidhi, I think, okay. and the, the companions of the Prophet asked the Prophet, what does this mean, wasat? Yes. And he answered, adal. Mm. Where do you see the word moderation there? Mm. Or kasadarhana'an. Mm, mm. When you say sadarhana in Malay, you are talking about a quantity. Right. Yeah. Isn't it? Yes. And instead, this wasat means justice. Yes. Therefore, when ummatan wasatan, it refers to a just people. Okay. People who are performing justice. In other words, these people have to know what is right, what is wrong, mm. what the place of things are in the system. Mm. They have to know this. Okay. Therefore, the people have to be educated. But if the people are not educated, how can you have an ummat and wasat? Mm. And this is what's happening today. On the one hand, you talk about wasatiya, mm. but without justice. Mm. Yeah. And then there's trouble. There's angst. Mm. There's difficulty. Mm. It's because there's no justice. Right. You don't have justice, you'll never have peace. Mm. This is the problem. But on, on, in, in your last interview, in your last in appearance at IKIM uh, Radio, you also mentioned the fact that, that uh, there are other two groups who contribute further to the, our present predicament, that of the scientists and the business people. Uh, I mean, are, are they... How, can you please elaborate further on, 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 on how do they... I mean, I think we should just give a general comment because now we are talking more importantly about these, uh, the Muslims, the influence of politics and politicians on Muslims and on the religion of Islam. Right. I mean, the businessmen, yes, they are responsible also for this corruption. Yes. I mean, they are, they, are, they are marketing things to the population which are really unnecessary. Mm. Or they are wrong, for instance. Right. I'll give you an example. Islamic banking. Right. Is it really Islamic? Mm. In my opinion, it is not. It does not fulfill the requirements of the Sharia. Okay. And yet, on the Islamic bank boards, mm. they claim they have a Sharia advisory council. Yes. And that whatever they give, whatever they, they, uh, they, uh, they, they try to sell to the public, mm. is Sharia compliant. Right. Well, let's ask this question then. Mm. Do the people who are appointed to the Sharia board, do they understand conventional banking? Yes. Do they understand uh, Islamic economics? Yes. Do they understand Islamic banking? Right. Are they very familiar with the, the law? Mm. Do they know all these things? Mm. I mean, know, really know. Yes. Do they know theology? Mm. Do they know what it means when, they, when the Quran talks about riba? Do they know what riba means there? Right. Right. If that's the case, they will be the ones advising the banks. Yes. But is that the case? Or is it the case that they don't understand uh, conventional banking, mm. that the, the banks summarize what they want to do, mm. and they present it to the Sharia board, mm. and they tell the Sharia board, this is good for us. Mm -hmm. And therefore, this is good for the Muslims, which means that we want your rubber stamp to make it Sharia compliant. Right. Right. Because how is it if you say you are an Islamic bank and that you are doing Islamic banking, yes. how is it when you issue sukuk, yes. 
when you talk about sukuk and you issue sukuk, mm. this sukuk is issued to pay off the debt of a country. Right. Yes? Mm. Or they issue this sukuk to pay off for development, the right. cost for development. Right. They want to develop, the, let's say, the light rail transit, the monorail, okay. they'll issue sukuk. Okay. Who buys this sukuk? Mm. It's the local public. Mm. G uh, generally speaking, I'm not saying that it's always the locals, no. Sure, sure. It's mostly the general public who pay for this. So they are the ones who pay for the development of this project. Yes, yes. Now, if you want to say this project is Sharia compliant, first you have to look at another thing. Mm -hmm. If you're going to build something like this, yes. how does it impact the environment? Right. Mm -hmm. Let's not forget that we have to pay attention to the environment. If we are talking about Islam, we are being a Muslim ourselves. Yes. We have to look at the environment, yes. our concerns for the environment. Yes. How does it impact the supply of water? Right. How does it impact arable land that we could use to supply food? Right. What kind of waste will the project generate? Mm. All these things have to be answered by the Sharia board right. before they can tell the bank, yes, we want you to issue sukuk. But I don't think that's being done. I'm not saying that it isn't. I, I just don't know. Yes. But judging by the way things are going, mm. I don't think that the Sharia board has truly understood these elements. I mean, these are just four of them that I pointed out. Sure. There are many more. Yes. Thank you, Dato, for sharing your thoughts on this. We will listen more to what our honourable guest has to say as for the solutions and its priorities for the most urgent problems that we are facing today. Stay tuned to the next episode of Nazra on www.tvikim.my With that, I thank you. Wa billahi taufiq wal hidayah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.